Hi, Jim Gallagher here. I am the pastor at Clavel Assembly in Forster, Rhode Island. And we decided to come on YouTube, and this is our first program in establishing uh, a program for the ministry of Clavel Assembly. And we're calling our program The Victory Hour. Now, there's a couple of different reasons we're calling it The Victory Hour. For one, it's the, this program, this, this particular program you're watching right now, uh, is going to last for a half hour. And I'm hoping, at least by October, to be producing two programs per week, two half hour programs per week. So you get one hour per week, and thus the Victory Hour. But we call it the Victory Hour because this was, I, I was on the radio for 22 years, and just last month, we decided to transition from the radio to the internet. And uh, we, I, I, being on the radio for 22 years, I had a program every Saturday for an hour on 1590 WARV in Warwick, Rhode Island, and um, enjoyed being on it. And we still have our sermon. We have a sermon edition of the Victory Hour uh, for Clavel Assembly every Sunday, um, 5 to 6 o'clock. And right there, when you check that out, and you can live stream it. And you also can see it at at on demand. You don't have to live stream it when we're doing it, but on demand. And uh, our sermons are every Sunday, five o'clock, if you're live streaming it. And um, uh, those are sermon proper sermons proper from the pulpit of Clavel Assembly. So that's still there on the radio. But we took our Saturday broadcast, which was me talking directly to the radio audience which I did for 22 years, and we're shifting it to YouTube. And we were reading the tea leaves, uh, according to God's providence, and we uh, came to the conclusion that would be the right and proper thing to do, so long as YouTube will have us. I mean, we have to have free speech. I'm a Christian minister. I've got to speak my mind. Sometimes when it comes to social media, it's pretty obvious they don't want you to speak your mind anymore. And our society is changing. So at any rate, here we are on YouTube. We're, we're thankful and we're grateful uh, to be here. And as to why it was called the Victory Hour, actually this, this program, as it started on the radio, started 40, 50, 60, 62 years ago. Not by me. I mean, I'm only 62 years old. I mean, I don't think I was broadcasting from the hospital when my mother gave birth to me. But my predecessor, uh, uh, Reverend Enio Cugini, he actually started the Victory Hour back in 1960-61 and was the host of the Victory Hour for uh, 40 years until he went to be with the Lord. And he was training me for the ministry to take over uh, once he was gone. And I did that. And uh, since that time, I've been the pastor at Clavel for 22 years, and I've been the host of the Victory Hour radio broadcast for 22 years, and we were on television as well. But now we're taking it to YouTube. So here we are. This is uh, program number one. So we got some preliminary stuff to go over because this is a brand new channel. So permit me to do that. And let me just say this, too. The other reason we call it the Victory Hour is because you've got to understand that as believers in Christ, we have victory. Now, sometimes in your life, it may not seem like you're experiencing victory. <laughs> I mean, we can all go through hard spells. There's no doubt about it. We live in a, a sin-cursed earth, and everything maybe doesn't go the way that we want it to go. That doesn't matter. We know that we have the victory in Christ. Christ conquered death 2,000 years ago. And Christ died and rose again from the dead, according to the scriptures, so that those that believe in him could have eternal life. And he has purchased for us eternal life if we're in Christ, if we've been born again, and we've received God's grace. We are the sons and daughters of the living God. There's nothing that men can do to us to change that. We already have the victory because Christ has the victory, and his victory is our victory. So this is why we call it the Victory and why we call it the Victory Hour. I think through the month of September, I'll just be posting 
uh, one program per week. And then I'm hoping by the time we get into October, we'll be doing two programs per week. That's the plan anyway, uh, Lord willing, of course. So I think we need to introduce ourselves in a, in a basic way today. And I won't even be able to do that uh, to the degree that I really would like to. So it will probably spill over into the next uh, program that we post here on YouTube. Um, but that's the history of the Victory Hour. It started off on radio, 1590 WARV in Rhode Island. And now we've shifted it to YouTube. We closed down the Saturday program of the Victory Hour just a month ago. And um, uh, the Sunday virgin version of uh, the Victory Hour, the sermons from Clavel Assembly, um, they still air on WARV. And our sermons, by the way, our sermons also air at sermonaudio.com under Clavel Assembly. Or you can go to our website, clavelassembly.com. That's our website, www.clavel, C-L-A-Y, V-I-L-L-E, clavelassembly.com. All one word, all, all lowercase letters, clavelassembly.com. If you click on sermons, there's a whole ton of sermons there. Uh, that you can see there's a statement of what we believe and i'm going to review that a little bit with you today and so and you if you want to email me and contact me you can do that my email address is info at clavelassembly.com right that's info at clavelassembly.com you say okay all right uh, that's all very nice and good but what is the point to your program here on YouTube. There's lots of people on YouTube. What is the point to you being on YouTube as well? I think that's a fair question. Um, I feel that the purpose of this program, the purpose of the Victory Hour, um, is to, and you'll discover this through the course of time, that we're going to, on this channel, we're going to teach theology, Christian theology. We're going to teach doctrine, Bible doctrine. Okay, we're going to teach theology, we're going to teach doctrine, but we're also going to talk at times on what some people would consider politics, but I don't consider it politics. See, politics is a window into the moral soul of our nation, it's how we're choosing to govern ourselves. And that's a reflection on who we are. And that's important for a minister to make note of. So we'll talk about uh, politics at times and our culture at large. And uh, I have to tell you, right now, we're going through a revolution. It's not a good one. Um, right now, this administration that is govern us, governing over us right now is a globalist, radical, leftist, Marxist, fascist, anti-American, anti-Christian administration, top to bottom. There's no other way to say it. That's just the truth. And so there are times when I'm going to have to uh, blow off some steam and let uh, uh, that pressure release valve <laughs> do its thing. And we do so within the context of the Word of God and the obligations that God has given us as his people. And a minister must preach the whole counsel of God. Now, I got to tell you something about that. This YouTube channel is not the local assembly. So you're not going to get the whole counsel of God on this YouTube channel the way you might get it, say, from the pulpit of Clavel Assembly. The assembly needs to be taught. God's people, when they come together in their corporate meetings, need to be taught the whole counsel of God. But this is an outreach ministry to the world at large. So there's going to be a little bit different emphasis. So you've got to understand that. They're not the same thing. By the way, there's no such thing as an internet church. Let me make that clear. You, you don't go to church by tuning in on the internet. By the same token, I recognize it is a very backslidden day. And Christianity has been greatly compromised. And I think there's a lot of Christians that find it hard uh, to find a home church 
in the area in which they live. So if until God uh, answers that prayer and gives you a home church that you can attend, I can understand people uh, standing fast with a uh, uh, a ministry that airs over the internet. Well, I'm I'm perfectly fine with that. Don't misunderstand me. But I think when it's possible, and it's not always possible, but when it's possible, you need a local assembly that you can go to and stand with and fly your flag and and be there for the people and the people be there for you. That's fundamental. That's fundamental. But we're in a very backslidden culture. You know, they got the Great Reset going, the Green New Deal. These are all Marxist, uh, leftist, radical plans. And the, the goal, the Great Reset, the whole kit and caboodle, the whole thing is designed to transfer wealth from the average person to the ruling elite who already have most of the wealth. That's what this is. They are lying to you. This is about control and power. Be sure of that. And so, sometimes we're going to be talking about that. But we're interested in theology and doctrine. We're interested in politics and our culture. But most importantly, what the Word of God teaches. And that's the emphasis you're going to get here um, on this channel when you tune in to Clavel Assembly. You've got to go to Clavel Assembly Official. I should explain that too. If you just type in Clavel Assembly, you'll see, well, we had an old channel on YouTube from years and years ago. You look at it, you can tell I'm a, a lot younger. Um, that goes way back. And that channel was run by somebody else. They asked, hey, could I take some of your television programs and, and post them on YouTube? I said, yeah, go ahead. So he did it. And then he disappeared and never gave us the access codes to get into the YouTube channel. I asked him about it, and he says, oh, he couldn't remember what they were. Really? So that channel is frozen. I've never been able to add to it. I can't delete it. It's just frozen in eternity. So that's Clayville Assembly. That's not this channel. You got to get me, this, this, this right here. You've got to go to Clayville Assembly official. Official. Isn't that what it says? Clavel Assembly Official. And that's the one that we have right here. And that's the one that's up to date. And you'll see that as you go. So uh, do that and, and tune in. And we're going to teach doctrine, theology, and all this kind of stuff. Now, <clears throat> why should you even tune in a second time? Here I am rambling on. Because we're trying to introduce ourselves. And in order to introduce ourselves, this is our first posting. If you go to our YouTube channel now, you'll see this. Now, I think over the next few months, we'll put in some uh, past programs we've made and maybe a few sermons just to give some body there that you can look at. But basically, when you go to this channel, you're going to get what's airing on YouTube. But we will be adding some things there just to have some stuff there up front, and we'll keep them there. Some, some things that are pertinent, okay? But all these are going to be posted on YouTube. and. I think it's important for us to let you know who we are. So I think what I'll do for the balance of this program today is just go over the basic doctrines that we at Clavel Assembly hold to so you understand where we're coming from. And by the way, I do need to say this. <laughs> um, it's Clavel Assembly. We used to be called Clavel Church. Under my predecessor and mentor, Pastor Cugini, it was Clavel Church. It always was. It was before he got there. When I became the pastor, I wanted to change the name to Clavel Assembly. You say, well, why would you do that? Well, let me first tell you the reason I didn't do it. I didn't change it from Clavel Church to Clavel Assembly because we're associated with the Assemblies of God movement. Let me make this very plain. Clavel Assembly has no relation to the Assemblies of God. In fact, I thought very seriously about not changing the name to Clavel Assembly because I didn't want to be mistaken as being associated with the Assemblies of God. So let's make that clear. We have no connection 
with the assemblies of God. We are not charismatic. We are not Pentecostal. We haven't gone through that revolutionary theological compromise, which is called the Pentecostal or charismatic movement. You say, Pastor, those are strong words. No, those are weak ones. I'm giving you the bare minimum. You, know, you only take so much at once, you know. <laughs> but the reason, so why'd you call yourself Clavel Assembly? But he, this might be a little bit of a shocker to you, and, and, and I'll, I'll preach on it one time soon. Because there's no such thing as a church. The word church isn't in the Bible. Now look, I know the word church is in our English Bibles, right? You go to a King James Bible, you're going to see the word church. In fact, you go to almost any edition of the Bible, nowadays you'll see the word church. Well, yeah, in our English Bibles. But the Greek word for church is really probably kuriakos. But when you look at your English word church in the Bible, the Greek word is not kuriakos. The Greek word is ekklesia, kuriakos, belonging to the Lord. That's probably where the word church came from. Um, but when you see the English word church in your Bible, the Greek word behind it is ekklesia. Ekklesia. Ekklesia means assembly. That's why we call it Claval Assembly. More specifically, more fully, it means a called out assembly. We are a called out assembly. But why is that so important to change it because of that? You know what? I'll explain that another time. I can't get bogged down with that. Uh, I will fairly soon, uh, I hope I think to do it, <laughs> give you a nice full explanation of why we don't use the word church at Claval. It's an assembly, ecclesia, an assembly. The Tyndale Bible, the Reformation Tyndale Bible, not the Tyndale Publishers, but William Tyndale, when he wrote that um, first English translation of the Bible, he didn't use the word church. He translated it, I believe he translated it, congregation. Congregation. What is a congregation? They assemble. They congregate. See, it's the same thing as assembly, really. So he did the same thing I did. So I'm in a very strong Reformed tradition by instead of reading the word church, we read assembly, or you can say congregation. And the King James translators, when they were given their rules to follow, one of the rules were, do, do not change the word church, leave it. And that was a mistake. By the same token, well, I don't want to get ahead with that. So I, what, I, what I want to do is this. I want to give you just a quick overview of the things that we believe, I consider Clavel Assembly very orthodox in its doctrine. Now, the question is, what is orthodox? I'm afraid sometimes theologians and ministers describe certain things as being orthodox doctrine, when in truth, they're not really orthodox. They may, they may be true, but they're not orthodox, as in orthodox in the sense as in necessary in order for you to consider yourself a true Christian. You know, they're so fundamental, it's required in order for you to actually, un to actually and accurately understand yourself as a Christian. If that's what orthodoxy means, uh, I think the church has exploited orthodoxy and have, has used it as a means to bully people and cause them to knuckle under to their system of belief. So I think there are some things that are described as Orthodox necessities when in fact they're not. But be that as it may, I can't get into all that now. Let me give you an overview of the things that we believe that I think you'll grasp readily. Now, I, I, if you go to our website, I'm going to read, we have a, a bullet point list of doctrines we believe. And I'm just going to read uh, from that list that comes from our website, clavelassembly.com. If you click on beliefs, you're going to see this list with Bible references supplied. I'm not going to be reading to you today the Bible references. I, want, I just want you to have an overview of where we're coming from. I think we owe that to you. See? Uh, first in the list, the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God. That's what we believe. We don't believe the Bible contains the word of God, but there's a lot of error in it too. No, we believe that every word is God-breathed. It doesn't mean that it's all 100% accurate in our English translations. It doesn't mean it's all 100% accurate in our 
uh, underlying Greek manuscripts because of the modern Bibles that they're putting out now are garbage. They have undermined the authority of God's Word. We'll talk about that in another time. If I was you, I'd stick with the King James Bible or maybe the Geneva Bible. Something that's relying on the Masoretic text for the Old Testament and the majority text for the New Testament. I know that the um, King James uses Stephen's text, but that comes from the majority text. In other words, what we've understood for 1,800 years as being the scriptures in the Hebrew and the Greek we continue to believe that was the scripture God preserved. Then Westcott and Hort comes along and says, oh, well, we, we made some discoveries. It looks like we got to cut some things out of the Bible. Oh, so we didn't really have the Bible for 1,800 years? I reject the premise, particularly when it comes from liberals like Westcott and Hort, which your NIV, your ESV, all your modern Bibles are founded on that junk. I'm not, I'm not a King James only person as if Oh, the King James Bible, the English translation, perfected the errors in the Greek in the, in the Hebrew. No, I'm not a Ruckmanite or anything like that. I'm not King James only in that sense. But I do promote the use of the King James because it uses the proper uh, Hebrew and Greek manuscripts or the Geneva Bible. There's the KJ3 Bible, which I think is very good as well. Very, very literal too. And it makes some corrections. Um, uh, that needed to be made from the King James, but it's using the same Greek and Hebrew text, and that's what I like. I don't have a problem with modern Bible translation, but they can't be using the Westcott and Hort junk. That's to say we don't believe in the preservation of the Word of God. We'll talk about that some other time. But we do believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Secondly, we believe, and I'm, I'm just reading this right off of our website, that there is one God who is sovereign over all his creation, being most holy and righteous, and, th and though great in mercy and love, will by no means clear the guilty, and is therefore a God to be reverenced and feared. Oh, amen to that. I'd love to expound upon that, because this generation needs it, but I don't have the time today. <laughs> and and you'll, say, you'll see that uh, the descriptions on some of these, like that one, sounds very familiar to some of you. It sounds like the Westminster Confession. Or it sounds like the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Well, there's a good reason. Because, well, it was fundamentally taken from that. We've tweaked. See, basically, we, the 1689 London Baptist Confession was a Baptist version of the Westminster Confession. They took the Westminster Confession and tweaked it for Baptist use. Well, we at Clavel have taken the 1689 London Baptist Confession, and we have tweaked some of its shortcomings for Clavel's use. So we're using the nomenclature of the Westminster and the 1689 London Baptist Confession. So don't think that we're stealing their words. I'm giving credit where credit's due. Those documents uh, have some very wonderfully, beautifully um, uh, stated doctrinal positions with succinct language that I think is worthy of emulating. And, and thus we do in our own confession. Where it's prudent, where it's not prudent, we don't. Okay. All right, next item. That God exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Trinity. Yes, we believe in the Trinity. I know, in the internet world, where everybody's a preacher and a theologian, there's a lot out there, oh, wait, there's no such thing as a Trinity. That's the church trying to control you. That's Holly Squaw Swoggle. Boulder Dash, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> no, look, I know there's no such thing as the word Trinity in the Bible. You know, wah, 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 wah. Yeah, I know that. But the, the, the Bible teaches explicitly God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And it does not teach modalism like oneness Pentecostalism teaches. There is one God, not a committee of three that act as one, only one God. The Son is one with the Father. The Holy Spirit is one with the Father and the Son. The Son is one with the Holy Spirit. They are one. It's not a committee of three. You say, I don't understand that. Well, good, join the club. Stop trying to and just believe God's word. That's my position. 
I got more on that philosophically as time goes by, but not today. All right, next item. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ of God. Oh, that's important. And actually, dispensationalism doesn't fully embrace that. Now, I'm sure if you're a dispensational and you're listening to me, you say, hey, that's not true. We believe Jesus is the Christ. Well, I know you believe he will be the Christ. He will be the Messiah in his millennial kingdom. But right now, he's just the savior of a church. No, we don't believe that. We believe that Jesus presently is the Christ. And he's the son of the living God. I won't say any more on that because, again, my time is short. The next item, that Christ, being God in the flesh, died on the cross for the sins of his elect. Christ died in our stead. It was a vicarious atonement. He bore our sins and carried our sorrow. And Christ, in the flesh, bore the sins of his people so that they could be forgiven and have everlasting life. Now, there's obviously more to say than that. That's at the heart of the gospel, but I'll leave it there for now. Uh, next on what we believe, that Christ rose again from the dead to the right hand of the Father. Now, people say, Amen. He rose from the dead to the right hand of the Father. Amen. Oh, wait a minute. We got a trailer on that. That Christ rose again from the dead to the right hand of the Father, occupying the throne of David. Christ now sits on David's throne. He sat on David's throne in his resurrection. The dispensationalists say, well, no, that's not true. David's throne is supposed to be in Jerusalem. Obviously, Jesus isn't reigning in Jerusalem now. So he doesn't sit on his throne now. He sits in the throne of David, not until the millennium. That is false doctrine. I can disprove that up, down, and sideways, and every way in between. It's irrefutable. He sits on David's throne now. That's our doctrine. But I can't go further with it for today. <laughs> Next item on the list. That salvation is by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and if not dependent upon the works of men. We'll preach holiness, we'll preach righteousness, but we are not saved by our good deeds. We are saved by God's grace. And next item on the list, that baptism is an act of obedience to the Lord, wherein a person bears witness to his new life in Christ. Biblical baptism is by immersion, being preceded by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, by repentance and by faith. You don't have faith without repentance. What do you think we're being saved from? The guilt of our sins. Repentance is inherent in saving faith. Now, these are the doctrines... Well, except for a few things I've said that may be added to, that I think most uh, Christians can agree on. Now, some won't, but um, most of your conservative, Bible-oriented, uh, Bible baptism, baptism uh, mode of thought, you can agree generally on all the things I've said. See, that's why I say, look, we're an orthodox assembly. Now, I haven't finished reading the doctrinal beliefs because I'm out of time. There's just a few more, but these few more represent the clavel distinctives, and I'm not going to hide them from you. So you tune in the next time, the next posting, posting number two on YouTube. I'm going to explain to you the clavel distinctives. What makes clavel a little bit different from the rest? And I'm not saying there's no one else that believes these things. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the vast majority will disagree with the other things I'm going to bring to your attention. And I may shock you, but I challenge you to be a Berean and to search the scriptures and to see whether these things be so. Well, look, my time's up. I've got to go. Let me thank you for watching. This is Jim Gallagher reminding you in the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.